Right. Well, hello, everybody, and um, welcome to another open source VC meetup from, from Airtree. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Jax. I'm a principal at Airtree Ventures here on the investment team. Um, I'm very excited today um, to have a conversation with all of you and with Kat Cole, um, who I've been following from afar for, for a little while, and I'm very excited to kind of have a live conversation and be able to ask all those questions um, that have been percolating over the last few months. Um, for a bit of context on kind of the, these meetups, um, we started these meetups back in March um, because I think at the time we were all searching for connection as we just uh, got stuck at home and a lot of founders had to make some pretty tough decisions quite quickly. Um, we wanted to give you access to people who had been through those times before. So we brought in um, founders and CEOs of businesses that had struggled through and survived the first financial crisis. Um, and after a few weeks of that, we started bringing you through, bringing in other founders who could talk about how to slingshot your way out of the crisis. So getting your business prepared um, to take advantage of, of what could be changing behaviors um, through the crisis. And then we kind of realized that the, um, so many people were, were attending these and, and the outpour of love afterwards was, was pretty incredible. And so we wanted to continue it. And we thought it fitted pretty well in with our ethos as a fund. Um, actually, we talk a lot about open sourcing VC, um, opening up the black box that is, you know, how do VC funds work? What are the legal docs? Um, what are standard term sheets and financing docs? And we're trying to open up access now to angel investing with our Explorer program. And this is all part of that. Now we're opening up access to our networks through um, speaking with incredible investors and operators around the world. Um, I, uh, so we have some questions that have come through ahead of time. And obviously I've prepared a bunch. Um, <laughs> for any of, anyone who was on our Explorer AMA earlier this week, um, we got Zoom bombed, which was a pretty, was kind of funny to be honest, um, funny experience, but it means that we are no longer allowing people to unmute themselves just in case. So if you have a question, please could you write it in the chat? Um, we'll be leaving some time at the end to ask those questions. So um, looking forward to that. And uh, now I think it is time to welcome our guest, Kat Cole. So Kat is the COO and president of Focus Brands. Um, Focus Brands is uh, close to a $5 billion product sales company, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, it's the owner, franchisor, and operator of brands, including Cinnabon, Moe's, and Carvel. Uh, previously, she led the turnaround of Cinnabon while it was going through the kind of combined uh, difficulty of both the financial crisis and the Atkins craze. Um, and before that, kind of when all the way from uh, through the ranks from waitress up to president of Hooters. Um, so she has a pretty extraordinary story to tell um, and outside of her day job also has a pretty impressive record of both humanitarian work and angel investing. Um, so the reason I've been so excited to chat to Kat is because every time I've heard her speak, uh, she always speaks, uh, I always learn something new and um, the, the conversations are always very operational. Um, it's not kind of high level, uh, kind of ideas and strategy. It's always very kind of tactical on the ground, how to deal with people. Um, and I think that's, that's really powerful for all the founders out there who are, you know, working in businesses day to day. Um, so without further ado, welcome Kat. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hi everyone. Um, and so I kind of want to kick off, um, and talk about kind of a very thorny topic to start, which is brand. Um, and I want to, understand that you've invested in and worked in several um, wonderful brands today. Um, and, and I want to understand how you think about brand architecture and also think about um, what your brand has the right to do. So let's start there. Yeah, you know, first, my belief around brand is that of course, it has traditional elements like logo, color, taglines, um, different statements that are associated with it, brand voice, but at its core, brand is a promise to the consumer. And that promise is made from marketing in part. Yes, the logo, yes, the advertisements, yes, social media, but that's only a piece. The other piece is through customer's experience with the company, the product, therefore the brand, 
over time. And, and what we all want as people who build businesses is for what we promise in our marketing to be consistent with what people experience. But over time, what they experience becomes more of the brand definition than our marketing because people trust what they experience, not what we say. So let's start there with that's the definition of brand, a consistent promise formed first by marketing, but more over time by the experience that people have. And things that are, are relative to brand have to do with one of two buckets, um, brand relevance and brand differentiation. Anything that makes a brand win is is in both of those buckets. Brands that are the most successful sustainably, country to country, product to product, vertical to vertical, are high on both of those, relevance and differentiation. Some brands can be high on one and low on the other. So high on relevance, but low on differentiation is typically a commodity. It's a race to the bottom. It means something in a lot of people's lives, but it doesn't stand out in any way. So it's a price, uh, a price war for who can be the cheapest. The opposite, high on differentiation, low on relevance, is the other side of the coin, which is typically premium price, very differentiated, not accessible. So the volume potential and the market potential is quite low. Businesses can be successful when they are high on one and low on the other, but not optimally and not in many markets and typically not over time. You need to be high in both. So that's just the, my foundational beliefs after buying brands, um, evaluating businesses that we've turned down because we didn't believe they had enough potential there, my investing activity in consumer brands and startups. So this is true for B2B, SaaS, and B2C, or the ever more popular B2B2C um, that is growing. It's true no matter what, because it's your company name, your company promise. But I will share more consumer-leaning examples because they're a bit more obvious and they translate a bit more easily um, to all of us as consumers. And so understanding what that brand promises is step one. Step two is deconstructing it into its parts and realizing what about those things has permission to travel and where the target customer, not all customers, give it permission to go. So an example um, I'll give is Auntie Anne's pretzels. It's the largest warm bakery, pretzel bakery uh, franchise in the world. So 2000 locations, 45 countries, mostly Pacific Asia um, and North America, little bit of Europe and the Middle East. It's not our largest brand, but it's our biggest franchise business by units. Cinnabon is our largest brand. And Auntie Anne's is known for warm, fresh baked pretzels. And when we were porting that brand, bringing it over to Turkey, to the Gulf region. It had been very successful in Egypt, very successful in UAE, where we already have wild success with Cinnabon and very good franchise partners. We thought, well, we're already successful in the Gulf. Why not keep creeping up the Mediterranean, go into Turkey, bring, you know, they love baked goods. It's a wonderful product. Surely it will be widely um, accepted and wildly successful. We launched the franchise, great location, awesome franchisee, beautiful logo and marketing, same marketing that works in the Middle East. Um, we open it, no one comes, no sales. I mean, very few sales. It was in a prime location in, a, in the front entrance of a shopping center. Should have had two to three X the sales of an average location just by foot traffic alone. I travel to go figure out what was going on. After sitting there listening to customers, we realized that it's a premium baked good and it's a twisted pretzel, you know, with little salt dots. Um, and it looks a lot like a product called Simit that is a tiny twisted bagel-like product sold on the streets of Turkey for centuries, literally centuries for one lira. So we were selling this product for two, three, 400 times the cost because we believed the product had permission to travel and that the brand's premium bakery position would translate. But in fact, because similar products were sold for pennies, literally cents on the street, people thought we were crazy. Eventually we had to lower the price, reposition the entire brand, not as a pretzel brand, but like Simit, but different. And it allowed us to understand we had credibility in baking, but we couldn't assume that even our authority in pretzels was going to translate 
around the world. And so for me, brand and the brand promise isn't just about understanding what we want the customer to see. It's about understanding how the customer receives it relative to their reference set in their local community and in their country. And that has everything to do with shape, packaging, price, the name of the product and what we sell as a total business. And I guess uh, this uh, this is a really interesting thing, I think, for Australian businesses, particularly um, because I think Australian businesses often face like they, they decide to go one of two ways. They decide to go after the US or they decide to go after Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, and Southeast Asia is, is, is complex because it's many different countries and many different cultures. Um, when those businesses are facing that decision, what would you recommend they think about as, as they're trying to come up with their strategy for internationalization? Well, don't do what we did with Auntie Anne's and just go, (laughs) you know, and assume. The key to success in multiple countries and cultures is, is of course, first the acknowledgement and recognition that the nuances, even if they're subtle, between cities, much less countries, can be material. And, And so the first question is how well do you know why your product is successful today in your home market. And Jax and I were talking about this yesterday, but I've often found myself as a, as a leader, my franchisees and the founders that I mentor or the companies I invest in, we all are very good at questioning failure. When something doesn't work, we iterate, 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 keep going and fix it. But when it's going well, we rarely question it as much as we should. And that is dangerous because when we start jumping oceans, Um, and seas and crossing borders, we might wrongly assume what some of the success drivers were in the home market, assume those are true in a new market and fail fabulously and expensively because we have not decoded our success in our own market. So that's one thing. Step one, break down and challenge your own success. Don't assume the product is Um, highly defensible. Maybe in a region where you're operating your business, your service or your product just doesn't have a lot of direct competition. And maybe the country or the city you're going into is flush with competition. Uh, Or maybe again, price point. There are many reasons that are outside of your control that you might have success. And I learned this lesson for step one. There are three steps to this answer. Step one is decode your own success so you know what to duplicate and what to ask about. When I was a waitress, uh, I was a waitress at, at Hooters when I was 17, 18 years old. And we had a manager who was not very nice in our restaurant, but the restaurant was very busy. And I remember the corporate executives walking into our restaurant and giving this general manager an award for being general manager of the quarter. And all of us as waitresses looked at each other and thought, this guy's an ass, like why is he getting a reward? And the answer was because sales were up. Three months later, after this guy gets a bonus and gets promoted, sales of the restaurant dropped by 20%. The reason sales were up was not because he was a great manager, Um, it was because there was construction around the restaurant for many months and that was driving business into the store, but the company was rewarding the manager for his management. And actually the business would have been more successful if a good manager had been there. And I don't know why, but I will never forget that moment. It was so obvious to me that the big wigs at corporate were wrongly rewarding behavior that had nothing to do with what was going on in the store, in fact, was probably holding it back. And I. As a result of that and many other experiences I've had in life, I became obsessed with knowing the truth. I just assume whatever I think is wrong, whatever I see is not the full story, and that there are other things that I need to know in order to really understand what is driving something. So that's step one, decode your success. Step two, use that to ask questions about the next market that are not leading questions that lead the witness or lead the customer to what to say, or that just validate your own inclinations and your own beliefs. So when we were, um, we had an initiative to lower the calories of the classic Cinnabon cinnamon roll. 
It's high calories. It's fewer than you think. Um, and it's a very large indulgent pastry. But when the team went to lower the calories, they asked this question to various markets around the world. Here's the product. They showed the picture. We're going to be able to maintain the size, but instead of it being 880 calories, which I mean, it's this big, it's literally the size of your face. <laughs> instead of it being 880 calories, we're going to lower it to below 600. How do you like that? On a scale of one to 10, how much do you like that? 10, right? And the reality is who doesn't want to be bad without penalty? But that was the wrong question to ask because when we actually put it into test, which was happening right when I joined the company, taking over a bakery chain based in malls and airports during the recession in 2010, when we put it into a small test, no one bought it. How is it that everyone in a test says, this is amazing. And then we put it into the store and no one buys it. And it's very clear that we asked the wrong question. The right question would have been, now that we've lowered the calories, if you never bought it before, will you now? If you bought it infrequently, will you buy it more often? When we asked that question, the answer was no. People said they liked the idea, but when we asked the question about the right goal, not making people happy, but driving transactions, the reality is that we learned that in order to drive frequency in a snack food, while that calorie reduction from 880 to below 600 was a material and noble reduction, the thing, there is a line that gets most consumers to buy food as a snack, and that is 350 calories. Things must be below 350 in order for people to consider it a snack. We weren't even close to the psychological line that gets people to purchase a snack product. And oh, by the way, the way we were reducing the calories in this test was putting in artificial sweeteners. So even if it had driven transactions, it would have created another problem of removing real ingredients and putting in artificial ones. That would have been innovation, chasing an outcome that was not aligned with goals that would have created more problems for the brand. So the second piece of advice, the second step in getting your product right, your business right as it jumps countries and markets is decode success and be sure about what is driving the success of your brand and then ask open-ended questions. Show them and say, what does this make you think of? And the most important question, would you buy it? That will give you a sense of a bit of the market potential. Then you put those two things together and come up with what you think is a market launch plan. And that market launch likely has um, pre-seed, some anticipation strategies to get people, influencers, whether it's B2B or B2C, to be aware and excited about what you're doing, and then put a lot of energy around over-delivering on your first few customers, your first few partners that you have, so that whatever gets seeded in that country can start to grow on its own. One, two, three. Right. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I think, I think there's a there's a really interesting thing in kind of direct to consumer startups where a lot of we we've kind of seen this hype cycle go go through all the stages. And um, I think there was one stage at which a lot of brands were raising a lot of money early stage, and then and then almost like rushing the process of building a brand mm -hmm. and not going through this kind of testing process and 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 almost like the kind of fire hose of belief that you have as a founder, um, believing that would like force you to greatness rather than, you know, really like evolving with your customers and understanding and building that community. So I think, um, I think that really resonates. Um, I think, you know, one of the amazing things about direct to consumer brands is that you, um, you get this opportunity to, to really build community and really have like lots of touch points with your customers, understand your customers uh, in mm -hmm. great depth. And I think, you know, once you've um, built built your early understanding of your brand and, and your customer through D2C, a lot of businesses then want to kind of um, test the market in terms of different channels. Um, so should I create my own store where people can go in and like physically have a touch point and an experience with my brand? Um, and that kind of creates a halo effect for the brand, right? I drive more sales online as well. Mm -hmm. Or should I think about going wholesale? Um, how do you think about that kind of transition from direct to consumer through to omni-channel? And, and I guess that that's kind of um, B2B as well as B2C. You can think about kind of ex 
expanding your distribution channels in general? Yeah. First of all, for any founders that are listening, there is no playbook. Anyone who tells you there is an ideal sequence is full of shit. They've clearly not done it or they've only done it once and they're telling you what worked for them. The reality is there are many paths to building your brand and no one is in your shoes. That decision of what channels and when is deeply personal and individual to the business, to the funding you do or don't have access to, to how well known your brand is or isn't. You know, some founders um, don't have the luxury of sitting back and making all the choices. They're, they will have to go with whatever is the best option right in front of them, whether they really like it or not. And others have the luxury of being a bit more discriminating, maybe because they have access um, to funding in some other way, or they've got other products that are funding the company, and this is kind of a, a branch or a spinoff of the core tree. So I just, I, I want you to know that there are so many varied examples of channel strategy, and not one is consistently best. So just give yourself freedom within that framework. But every choice has consequences. And so, Wholesale obviously has compressed margins, but it's got distribution that you might not otherwise have access to. Some partners that you might be wholesaling to are premium and others might be discount. And how the brand is positioned relative to that retailer has some impact on your brand's positioning. And I remember some early CPG founders I was mentoring and they were launching a green, eco, healthy, better for you, premium snack bar. And they got a call because Walmart saw their product at a indie, like independent coffee shop uh, in, uh, in their backyard. And the founders had a very serious argument over whether or not they wanted to do business with Walmart. And one had an issue with the optics of being in Walmart. The other challenged that founder and said, but I thought we were about democratizing access to healthier options and what better way to democratize access than to get into Walmart. And there was this philosophical misalignment around the priorities of the brand and the business. And then given those priorities, what partners and what channels are most likely to drive those outcomes. So if you have investors, if you have multiple partners or a team, having these types of discussions in advance is incredibly important. So you're not arguing and missing a timely opportunity, but yet you're aligned around, is your mission to get as many of your cookie and everyone's hands? If so, that means you go everywhere. Um, again, if you have the luxury of marketing spend and time, you can be more thoughtful in the sequence. And in general, DTC, learn your customer, boutique outlets that you can connect with and get data from and have a good partnership and make some mistakes where you don't have the heavy volume commitment from a distribution standpoint, then a region of a large wholesale retailer and then national with that large wholesale retailer. Sometimes they'll want a period of exclusivity that may be worth it to get in with them, not permanent, but a period. And then you go into other retailers. Um, and so, but some people have started the opposite way. They've started direct to grocery or direct to mass club discount retail, got an audience and then hired a great marketer who helped them tell their story online and launch an e -com business. Um, the thing to keep in mind outside of there's freedom within the framework and, you know, pick your path because they all have consequences is understanding how they connect to each other. And if you're in all the channels, which our products are, we're the largest food and beverage licensor of restaurant brands in the world, not franchisor, but our products, I've got 110 SKUs. I've got a billion five consumer product business just in grocery using our restaurant brands, that's our legacy core business. But then we take those brands, work with amazing partners who already sell into retail and grocery, help to develop products that are right-sized for that consumer, that frequency, that price point, and that occasion. 
coffee creamer for Cinnabon, um, K-cups for um, coffee for Cinnabon, frozen pretzel dogs for Auntie Anne's going into grocery. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's a very large business. And we figure out what makes sense, where the brand has permission to travel, what, what product makes sense in that channel. So giant cinnamon rolls, the size of your face held hot, which is what is in our core business, does not make sense in grocery. They can't execute it. It's a low frequency product and grocery is high frequency turns. That's what they require X number per week, have to move off those shelves or they will kill the deal. So we have different, smaller, slightly less sweet products that are right for that channel and those customers, more family oriented. Understanding that over time, as the product shows up in more places, you might have channel leakage, meaning there could be some competition in between channels that doesn't optimize profitability. So understanding the margin of each channel, the occasion and whether any of them conflict with each other, and then doing really smart things like changing your package sizing, your pricing, bundles or singles, or the pack size itself is a way to protect differentiation of what's sold in each channel without confusing the consumer on your brand. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. I was thinking, as you, um, I was thinking, as you were describing that, I was thinking about your Cinnabon partnership with Burger King. And I think that, you know, that, that was obviously pretty game changing for the company. She had a huge impact on the bottom line. And, and, and I was wondering about how you approached these negotiations with these big, um, like the big uh, gorilla in the room, I guess. Um, <laughs> particularly, I think, you know, when you're a startup, you, um, you're always the underdog. You're probably younger than the people who you're going to be in the room with. You, um, you will feel like the underdog. They will think you're the underdog. Um, how do you approach these negotiations with um, kind of the appropriate sense of, um, I guess, self-belief, but also respect for the partner and understanding what they bring to the table as well and how to... Um, yeah how to maximize um, the, like, the upside for both parties. Yeah, I mean, that's the key is being honest about the brand and the customer. And the hard thing about any of us as founders or leaders of a company is we love our baby <laughs> and it can do no wrong. <laughs> um, and the reality is if you're gonna negotiate a partnership, you better have a pretty objective view of how the customer sees your brand um, because you have to defend what value you bring to the table and as you just said, Jax, you've got to then honor objectively what they bring to the table and no one loves their company more than they do. And so having target customer outcomes, understanding of how the brand has performed in various environments leading up to this, that evidence, what my brand, so what you're really doing in these licensed partnerships or negotiations is you're comparing my branded product to a private label product. What will my product do on your menu that a private label can't? In quality in the product itself, so how much better is it objectively, not just because I love my company, but you know, you, you taste it, that's what we do, right? We bring product and say, you eat it and eat it next to every other better, best product that you've ever had on your menu. It, I mean, it's no, no comparison. Literally our product is that good. So what's the product difference? But then if there's that big of a quality difference, of course, we're more expensive from a cost of goods perspective, which means Burger King in this case has to be able to charge their very price sensitive customer more than they typically would. And the only thing that would suggest that that is possible is that our brand has enough power to get people to try something that's more expensive on a value oriented restaurant chain. So it's both how good is the product really? And then what do you have to pay us for that? And then either A, what more can you get your existing customers to spend? Or B, which is actually more important, what new customers are we going to bring to your locations? Because we're giving access to a product that has a gap currently between the demand and the supply. And this is a little taste. It's not the core big product, but it's a tiny taste. So that like any negotiation is first honesty and candor and objective um, evidence of what you bring to the table and what the other brings to the table. I was very clear that it had taken us 23 years to open at that point 900 franchise units. Burger King had 7,000 units. And if I turned them on, I would have 7,000 more points of distribution in 90 days. There was no way that in our model, 
in any version of reality, I could come close to accelerating those points of distribution. At the same time, if Burger King were to launch a sweet treat, which their research told them they needed to do, they had nothing that they could do under their logo that would bring near the traffic and the repeat that our products could. So they were honest, we needed distribution, they needed a high quality bakery product brand. And the negotiation to come together was not easy. It was messy. Um, we asked for more than we got. They asked to spend less than they ended up spending. You bring the two things together and it tripled the EBITDA of the company um, in three years. And the marketing that, that, that they spent on our brand per year was more than the brand had ever spent in its combined existence on marketing because it's such a powerhouse of a business. And, and that was part of the negotiated contract and it benefited the legacy core business in malls and airports. And, and that we, we hoped for, but thought was not likely because it's such a different need state. But the power of the marketing drove sales for the franchisees and profitability for them and helped us tell the story of this little tiny cinnamon roll that we had launched, um, but that we didn't have a lot of money to go tell people about individually. And so it helped us reframe our brand as not a business that sells one giant thing, but rather that has many more palatable, more approachable portion sizes. And do you think there's ever a point that's too soon for a, for a company to partner with um, a big established player? Like in, in the sense that they may put all this marketing behind it, but if they don't get the messaging right, is there, is there a chance that partnering with someone they can destroy what you've got already? I would say that's true regardless of if the company is young or mature. Um, I've seen some partnerships go south because of the very thing you mentioned, just the messaging wasn't quite right, or the partnership had no business being in existence in the first place. Sometimes brands are so lopsided, it is very clear that one of them is benefiting and the other one is being drugged down. And so having the right um, research or intuition, you know, whatever it is, um, that you, where you can look at them and go, that makes sense, right? That, that belongs together. Or I'm really happy to see this here, but I don't think less of the brand because it's here. And relevant to startups, I'm such a huge fan of collabs, like strategic alliances and partnerships, not necessarily a startup with the big brand, but four startups together, right? Leverage your marketing spend, come together. If you have, if one of you sells plants, has a DTC plant business, one of you's got DTC candles, the other has a, um, a in-home virtual design service, why on earth? would you not come together and market yourself? If you're all kind of young, kind of cool branding, marketing to the same consumer, why would you not? And, and it, you don't have to wait for some giant marketplace to hand pick you and say, you, you, and you, you look great for my marketplace. That is a great idea. And that does have some legs and it certainly exists around the world, but I still am boggled at how um, founders don't just, chat with each other more often and say, let's just do something together. Um, and sometimes that happens under a common investment portfolio because the investors will sort of point out that we've got a thesis and it's why we looked at you both and we'll introduce you to each other. But I would challenge any founder or anyone on your team to reach out to other brands that you think might be delightfully complimentary and come up with super cool, inexpensive ways to lower your CAC, um, to get in front of people, cross market to each other if you have the legal right to do so, um, obviously, and show up in the marketplace together. Big fan of, of strategic alliances and partnerships. Yeah, I feel like streetwear and hip hop are, where, are the best in the world at this. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of see these amazing, I read a book recently from Bobby Hundreds talking about their story and um, Collabs is such a huge part of, of, of their growth and cheap growth. Um, I want to switch gear a little bit and talk about hospitality. Um, I'm a big fan of Danny May's book, Setting the Table, um, and bringing a kind of hospitality culture um, into every aspect of what you do and, and how you deal with customers. I, I guess um, you, your businesses have so many customer touch points and are so people driven. Um, I, I, how do you guys think about hospitality? You know, as the world becomes more digital, even for restaurants, uh, and certainly true for digitally native brands. First, hospitality 
it, it is about the customer experience. It's about them feeling welcome. So things like accessibility um, of your web design, of your app, of your platform, what's its ease of use, convenience? That's, that's a little piece of the recipe to hospitality is how easy are we to work with? Is it easy? And easy is connected to fast, of course. Um, so even though that sounds very functional and very product-like, it is, it is a, a piece of hospitality. Um, it's about being attentive, but since it's not in person, attentiveness shows up in different ways via technology. So that's kind of a, a piece of proactive hospitality that translates whether it's in person because people are in a hurry or on an app or using a piece of B2B technology because B2C technologies and experiences train the people who are working in companies that you're selling to um, in a B2B process. So they're, they're being trained by Amazon for speed. They're being trained um, by you know whatever the financial apps are of how they do their personal finances. They want the people who work with them uh, in a B2B relationship to provide that same ease. Um, the consumer, we as humans don't go backward in areas like technology and health. Uh, we just keep moving down the continuum and we never go backward. No one ever wants to, things to get less convenient and um, or or more poor service than what they've experienced. So that's a piece of it. The other piece is customer service, like actual customer service, that even if you're a pure tech platform, your SaaS, um, your enterprise, how you handle when things are bad is in large part how people remember you um, as a brand or a business in the marketplace. Our private equity um, firm's founder has this saying that I love which is I wanna be a good partner in good times and an even better partner in bad times. And I'm on the board of a company called Milk Bar. It's a very famous bakery out of New York. Uh, Christina Tosi is kind of like a world famous media figure and they sell cakes and cookies, delicious, insane shipped cakes. And when you're a brand that is about celebrations and you get that product wrong, it is a very damaging interaction with the customer. It's not just, oh, um, I bought some dishes and one of them was cracked, I can use the other three. It's, I planned a birthday and I ordered this to delight my husband or my daughter and it didn't come and she is in tears, right? That messing up in that kind of a business is very expensive. And so doing everything we can to not mess up is <laughs> obviously very important. But then how do, when we do mess up and we all inevitably will, how do we make sure anyone who is a part of that has an, a founder's mentality, an owner's mindset, that we do anything, everything, we make a bigger deal about it than they do. When we miss a cake delivery at Milk Bar, someone will physically drive multiple cases of cakes the very next possible day to that person's house with a courier who sings an I'm sorry song and sends letters and fully refunds. That, that level of obsession with customer delight, whether it's an app, um, a SaaS platform, a cookie, a cup of coffee, or a t-shirt, is a differentiator. It's how Zappos grew over time, if many people remember, um, and many other companies have this in their legacy, but sometimes founders are so busy building um, and don't run into a lot of problems in the early days that they fail to build reactive hospitality into the company's culture. Yeah, I think that makes tons of sense. I think that kind of combination of delight and consistency is, is kind of what brands made up of. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, again, I kind of wanted to switch gears again and, and talk a little bit about um, hiring. I know that, you know, probably none of the jobs that you've ever um, had where you, would you have passed the CV, CV screen for? Um, and so I think, you know, one of, the, one of the hard things about being the founder of a company at an early stage is you want to hire the most amazing people. Um, and the most amazing people are getting offers from Googles and Facebooks and, 
I don't know, investment banks and the rest. Um, and how do you, so how do you find the people who are high potential who wouldn't necessarily pass the CV screen? Um, yeah. and how do you test that for that best? I think seeing one, just having that open mindset, that quality of work comes in very different shapes, sizes, bodies, CVs, experience sets. So first the founder just has to have that belief. Then I would say an intentionality around diversity because you have to believe that even though there are varying dynamics, and by the way, managing a diverse team is not easy. It's actually quite easy to manage an undiverse team <laughs> because everybody's alike. Having a diverse team, hiring for diverse mindsets and non-traditional talent is only the first part of the equation. You'd better be pretty good um, at managing and bringing forward inclusion and creating space for people to have some friction because they're different <laughs> by definition of diversity. Um, so just don't think your job is done if you keep your eye out for non-traditional talent. I think the way I screen for it is I've learned to ask questions about um, their background that help me see the things I have learned I need to see. So grit and resilience. And you can ask questions that are not about just, did they maintain a positive attitude during tough times? That's a tiny piece. But did they stick with something for months or years? And if they stuck with something for months and years, did they also advance in responsibility? Not just advance, but were they nominated, voted? Did others believe in them? So that could be athletics. You were a player, you were a, a player and a buddy, you were a trainer, and then you were um, a volunteer coach, right? That is upward mobility where people have to respect you. If you were an engineer and then you led the black engineers committee in your company, and then you were elected president of that committee. These are the little signs that you can stick with something, you can build it, you can evolve and adapt, and others vote for you. Others want to see you succeed. And, and so that's a set of questions I've learned to ask no matter the background. I don't need a college degree to see that. I don't need somebody's fancy. To, I can ask questions about, as long as you've had life, you have lived for some period of two decades or more, I can find evidence of whether that exists or not. Um, and then the other piece is the ability to unlearn and learn. You know, how curious this, I'm looking for humility and curiosity on one side and evidence of that, and then courage and confidence on the other. So I ask about uncomfortable situations. Um, and by definition, someone who is a refugee, a first generation immigrant, um, it is literally in their lived experience to unlearn, learn, apply, and they've seen their parents do it, they've had to do it. Um, and so I give extra points, you know, just for that lived experience um, and can talk about things in a little bit of a different way because I respect that lived experience. So I try to sort through the specific things. I mean, obviously certain roles require technical skills. And so instead of asking about it. I know some people who've gotten a degree who are still not very good at technical skills. If it's a technical role, I ask for proof of their technical work. Here's a project, go do this. Here's the information, get it back to me. And if it's a meaningfully complicated um, example of work, I'll pay them for that. Of course, that's the right thing to do if they're gonna spend their time. And if it's not good enough, I don't hire them. Um, and so that, that helps it be about the work and the potential, I learned uh, this acronym when I was hiring in my restaurant days called MAP, Merit, Ability, and Potential. And everything I'm asking about is for evidence of merit, ability, and potential, and that can exist without the perfect resume or CV. Nice, I like that. I mean, I think, um, I think that's a really valuable point around the friction that diversity creates in the workplace and creating space for that as well. I think that's the thing that we, we often talk about diversity um, from that kind of front end of, you just need to get more diverse people in, mm -hmm. but we don't really have en as enough conversations yet about what you do once those people are in to make sure that everybody feels included and safe. And, so yeah. I think and the, holistic, the holistic definition of diversity you know, some diversity is pretty guaranteed 
if you have different lived experiences, especially if you're talking minorities, that they're guaranteed to have a different lived experience than the majority of the population. So within that comes different mindset, different way of viewing the world, different um, understanding of target customers' lived experiences, right? There's some, there are some benefits of diversity of thought that are inherent in other types of diversity, but those other things still need to be looked for. Um, like truly diverse perspectives, diverse thinking styles. I don't want all processors. I don't want all people who jump into a fire. So thinking about diversity in a holistic sense, um, but also acknowledging that certain types of diversity, gender, race, in many places, sexual orientation, um, that along with these things, by definition of their lived experience, come many layers of diversity of thought. And so I look at it holistically, but I also understand that I'm kind of guaranteed to get diversity of thought to a degree with other types of diversity, age as well. And I know you do a lot, um, as we're talking about gender, just a lot around women's causes. And I'm, I'm just looking at my screen right now and I'm on a tech focused call and there are tons of women staring back at me and it just makes me really happy. Um, I think one of the things that um, I want to see more of, uh, and I'm sure you do too, is kind of women coming to you with the biggest of ideas, the kind of Elon Musk level of ideas. I'm gonna change the way we live and work um, and in a really fundamental way. And I feel mm -hmm. like um, often women don't have the self-belief um, to even get to the stage of wanting to become a founder, let alone um, believing that they can almost will into existence a new future. And, and so I guess like, hey, what are your thoughts around how, what we can do better to, to enable um, women, more women to have that self-belief? Yeah, I think I'll connect it one to one of the questions someone asked a little earlier, um, cause I had a chance to see a few of them that were added, Anna said, uh, I'm curious why Kat took the role at Cinnabon. She must've had so many opportunities. Why go work for a mall based uh, baked goods business in the middle of a recession? Um, was she not daunted by the task ahead? Um, and so I'll, I'll connect these two things, kind of your point of thinking small, but also some practicality. So um, in the case of me, Cinnabon, Keep in mind, I was a college dropout, child of a single parent, had only worked at Hooters my whole life, and I was 31 years old, and Cinnabon was an, uh, at the time a five, $600 million business, and I was getting to leapfrog to be the president. So while, yes, it was a mall-based baked goods business in the recession, it was all already a half a billion dollar global business that I was getting to be the president of at the age of 31 with half the experience most companies would have typically replied. So actually it was a super badass <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> the, the daunting part of it though, um, the was I not daunted by the task? Absolutely not. To me, it was in such bad shape. I mean, it, I just thought this will be like shining a light in the dark. <laughs> it was so bad. And I actually love low expectations. As a woman who has the past that I have, I have enjoyed low expectations my entire life. And I knew that I could get into that business, understand its DNA. The product was amazing. I was a big fan of the product. To have a brand that was that beloved and a product that, that was that high quality, and the only thing that was wrong were the unit level economics driven by the recession, that is a fixable problem, right? Creating a brand is very hard. Coming up with a truly high quality product at scale is incredibly hard. This business already had that. Cinnabon has a 98% unaided awareness in North America and the Middle East. It's in the 70s in most other parts of the world, 70s or 80s. I mean, it's up there with like Nike and Coca-Cola in many parts of the world. That, that is daunting and it was already done. So I think it's just interesting, you know, the lens through which I saw it was that it had the hard part done and just getting in and fixing the economics and turning around the franchise business and then maybe finding some other opportunities to accelerate growth because recessions don't last forever. Um, I was, I was, I didn't know how I would do it, but I was certain I could figure it out. 
And that is a, a type of humble confidence. Um, irrational confidence is, I know what to do. I know how to fix this thing that is enormous and complicated. That's irrational. But humble confidence is, I definitely don't know all the answers, but I am absolutely sure I can figure it out. And that nuance of confidence, which then jacks to your question of thinking big enough, what I hope is that people, whether it's because they're younger or underrepresented or under-resourced or a minority in any way, gender or otherwise, if by our lived experience, we haven't had a lot of big thinkers around us and women tend to have more responsibilities at home and other things that cause concern for jumping off the cliff without a parachute, um, that's real. Right, it's very real and it gets more real depending on your life situation. And so there are other things in our head saying, well, that is a big idea, but I have two kids at home. That is a big idea, but my mom's really sick and I need something that's a bit more, right? There's a lot that is super real and what I have learned to love about myself and to try to teach in others is I have, my balloon is floating in the air. I have the vision, I have the dreams, but I have one foot on the ground. I am quite practical and grounded in the reality of things and therefore don't judge people's decisions. But what I would hate is if to your point, there were someone because they are a woman or a minority or younger who has an idea that has world changing, game changing, market shifting potential and just because of their lived experience, they don't allow themselves to talk boldly about it in the way that, yes, there are definitely lines along gender. If you look at how men traditionally talk about fundraising, right? A woman might say, oh, I'm not sure how much I need. Again, I'm, I'm stereotyping, of course, this is general, but, uh, but it, it is generally true. Oh, I think I could, I could probably, I could probably launch this with 75,000. So if you could give me 75,000 or maybe if I could have 50, I can figure it out. And a dude is like, I'm raising $3 million on a 50 million pre-valuation. You know, it, it's just a different, and again, I'm generalizing, this is not always true, but the jokes are the jokes because they are seeds of truth in them. And so there is, um, there is a reality that communities like this can help be supportive, um, being open about where money is going and why, and then encouraging women, minorities, or just inexperienced founders to understand that whether it's fundraising or maybe they don't need fundraising, maybe they get a loan that's plenty for them to build their business, but speaking boldly about what they're doing with their company also attracts talent, partners, and in a way becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the market uh, at times. When I took over Cinnabon, I called it a billion dollar brand. It had all the pieces. Collectively, it was technically $1 billion in sales, but I had to search to find every little product being sold in every channel. But as soon as I found it, I went on national television and said, this is a billion dollar brand and it will be a $2 billion brand um, in five years. And here's how we're going to, just that confidence, you know, I had swagger with that. It was true and the story needed to be told and we will be the most well-known indulgent bakery concept in the world. That was, and, and we are. Um, and, but the seeds of that were already true. I didn't just say it and it became true. The seeds were there, but as a, a leader, I spoke it into existence so others could rally around it. And then all of that became a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy and how we acted, our confidence in investing in future innovation, how we attracted new franchisees into our system that only made that number more true and faster. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've, I've done a terrible job here of leaving time for questions, but I'll definitely try and get to, um, to one or two in the chat now. And um, I've got a question here from Guru saying, um, does Kat perceive that tech companies underestimate the importance of marketing and the potential impact it can have on product uptake by subtly tagging on human psychology and behavior? 
um, doing this sometimes is perceived as cheating by technical founders. Um, I, what's your what's your answer for that? No, I, I don't think tech companies underestimate the importance of marketing. I think sometimes technical founders do because they're building. But once something has evolved into a more established company, typically I find the opposite, which I think might be what you're hinting at at the end, is that um, they, they so invest in marketing that they do that at all costs. Right. So I will acquire customers at all costs in a way that is not sustainable and certainly not profitable over time. So I've seen far more of that. Right. Just to do a big fundraise. All that money goes into customer acquisition. And then you look under the hood and you go, oh, yikes. You know, they're spending three hundred dollars to acquire every customer. And the LTV of the customer is one hundred dollars. And something about that is out of whack. And I see no visibility to that CAC coming down or that LTV going up. And there's a ton of competitors in the marketplace with established relationships with the target customer. What are they thinking? And it's just a race after the top line. Um, so so that's that's been more of my experience. But technical founders, like product people, don't necessarily, of course, they're strong in one area. They don't necessarily have a background in consumer psychology and need a good partner that can help them think through that as the product iterates over time. That makes, um, that is, that's very helpful, thank you. I, um, I, I kind of feel like we should wrap up there um, just to stay to time, but thank you everybody for your questions and I'm sorry if I didn't get to yours. Um, and thank you Kat for, for, for jumping on this call and having this conversation with us. I have so many more questions, um, but we'll have to save it for next time. Um, oh, well, please do send me questions. I'm easy to find. I have a newsletter on Substack and Twitter, LinkedIn, all the things. So if I can be helpful, let me know. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today um, for another open source VC meetup. Uh, next up will be uh, John will be chatting to Toby Pierce from Sweat in a few weeks. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all there.